pleased to welcome James Kelman to Politics and Prose Books to store for his new novel, Most Said She Was Quirky. James Kelman has written many novels, short stories, essays, and plays. He's been shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize several times and won the prize for How Late It Was, How Late, which I must say I read while on a backpacking trip across Europe, and it was the perfect accompaniment for a uh, dizzying trip. Um, in 2008, James Kelman won the Scotland's most prestigious literary award, the Satire, Satire Society Scottish Book of the Year Award for Kieran Smith Boy. Um, thank you again for coming tonight. Uh, if you'll please join me in welcoming James Kelman. Now, this new novel of mine is set in London and it's uh, written from the perspective of a, a single, a young single mother, a woman who, a uh, young woman of about 26, 27, around that age. And she has a, a daughter of six years of age. She is divorced uh, and is now living in London with her bo a new boyfriend. And her boyfriend is a, a young Muslim guy who is, uh, whose name is Mo, short for Mohammed. She works in a casino doing night shift five nights a week, and uh, her boyfriend, Mo, he works in a, a restaurant uh, six nights a week, six back shifts a week. He, she works a uh, night shift. Uh, and they have, a, they have a rented accommodation in South London, for those of you who know London. Uh, and when the, the novel starts, I'll just go right into it. It happened on her way home from the casino one morning. Helen noticed the two men through the side passenger window, a pair of homeless guys. One was tall and skinny, the other smaller, heavier built and walking with a limp, and quite a bad limp. They approached the traffic lights and were going to cross the road in front of her taxi, right in front of its nose. The lights were red but set to change. Surely the men knew that. The tall man was having to walk slowly to stay abreast of the other, almost having to stop. He was full bearded and wearing a woolen cap. Although he was taking small steps, Helen could imagine him striding out. His stride would be long and it would be hard keeping up with him. There was something else about him to do with his shape and the way he walked, just something. But would they make it across in time? Only if they hurried. They wouldn't hurry, not them. You could tell just by looking. They went at their own pace, and that was that. Helen looked away and then looked back. Her two workmates, Caroline and Jill, were beside her in the back seat, but they hadn't noticed the drama. The lights would change and the taxi would move. What would they do? Nothing. Just keep walking. Oh God, Helen hated this kind of thing. Why did she even notice? Typical. She always had to. Other people didn't. Only it was so tense. Too tense. Caroline and Jill were chatting about something else altogether. Caroline's husband, the never-ending saga, they hadn't noticed any of it, but the taxi driver had. This was Danny, one of the regulars. Helen saw his eyes in the rearview mirror, no doubt wondering the same as her. Would the men make it across before the lights changed to green? As surely they must, they must. Why was it taking so long? Another car pulled in on the outside lane. Helen was holding her breath. She didn't realise this until suddenly she breathed in and it made a sound. The tension was just, my God, but they walked so slowly. Alcoholics, muttered Danny. But they didn't look drunk to her. They reached the curb. The small man's limp really was bad, even painful. Perhaps he'd been in an accident. Then the tall, skinny one. There was something about him too, the way his elbows crooked his hands in his sight coat pockets. It was him Helen was watching. He was not in the slightest drunk. 
she recognised something, whatever it was, a kind of deliberate quality in how he moved, slow but not slow, slow in his movements but not in his thoughts, seeing everything, even himself. Helen settled back further in the seat. She didn't want him seeing her. Why didn't the lights change? This was the longest ever. At the moment the amber joined the red, the two men stepped out from the pavement onto the road. The exact moment, this was when they did it. It was so weird. At this time of the morning too, with everything so quiet, so peaceful, Helen could hardly believe it and was glad of the shadows there in the back. She didn't like being in taxis with poor people seeing her, as though she was rich. She wasn't. It was silly, but sometimes she felt that. They were directly in front of the taxi now. It lurched forwards a tiny fraction. Danny must have raised his foot on the accelerator pedal for one split moment only, but it was enough for the lurch, and the tall, skinny guy turned his head and stared in at the driver and at Helen and the other two women too. He was not that old either. Only how he he looked, wild, wild wild-looking, wild as in not dangerous. People might have thought that it was almost like crazy. They would think that too. He was not. Only mannerisms, how some people... Brian, it was Brian... Her brother, Brian, how could it be? But it was. It was his movements and his shape. My God, Brian, it was Brian. The car in the outside lane had rolled forwards, then halted. The lights were green. The taxi quivered but could not move. How far had the pair travelled? Hardly at all. They didn't care. So aggressive, Brian was not aggressive. It was his physical shape, but not his behaviour. The way he was staring in at them, so intimidating, and forcing them to wait. And Danny was waiting, my God! He hated that. Patience, patience. Who ever heard of a patient taxi driver? He rushed everywhere, giving people rows. Not this time. Helen saw his head lowered not drawing attention to himself. Usually he was tough or acted like it. Helen had seen him before with other drivers. He never backed down. He would take them all on. That was how he acted. This was different. These two homeless guys made it different. They were going at their own pace and everybody else could wait. Now the taxi was moving. Helen opened her eyes, seeing out the window. Danny, the driver, shifted from second gear up to third, the engine roaring and rushing on, venting his anger and annoyance. Jill exchanged looks with Helen. The car in the outside lane must have been behind him. So too the homeless guys. Caroline had the phone in her hand and was smiling. I wanted to take the picture, she said, but I was too scared. Did you see his face? The one with the scraggy beard, the tall one. Helen looked at her. Caroline gave an exaggerated shiver. Oh, imagine meeting him in a dark night. And she spoke in a whisper. Why did you whisper? What was the point of whispering? So silly, just so silly. And not nice either, as though there was something horrible. It was prejudice, pure and simple. Are you all right, asked Jill leaning to Helen, nudging her arm. Yes, said Helen, but she wasn't all right at all. Just weird, that was how she felt. Caroline chattered on about the guy's height and how he was so, so thin and his beard and all of it like as if something was wrong with being tall and with a beard or being thin. Why people are thin, my God, what kind of world was it? For having no food, they get made to blame. If you don't have enough to eat and end up thin, it becomes your fault. It wasn't fair. Scraggy, that was a beard. So if you didn't comb it or shave it, if it was a beard, whatever men did, how could they? If they were homeless and didn't have any scissors or razors, how could you blame them? 
wild and scraggy. It wasn't fair talking like that, and like he was dangerous. Not if it was Brian, he was not dangerous. Never. And now Caroline was wanting to text her husband, even although he was asleep in bed. Why? What did she want to say? She didn't know anything. There wasn't anything to know. Except how he looked. And Jill too. I thought he was creepy, she said. It wasn't like Jill to say that. People were prejudiced. And Danny the driver heard her and was listening. Helen saw his eyes reflected in the rear mirror. That word creepy. It could be said about a lot of men. She didn't much like Danny. He acted as if he was there to protect them. But was he? No. Would he? No. Danny was there to drive his taxi, and that was that. Just got on with a job and make his money. That was him. Now he shouted back over his shoulder, What you think about them then, eh? Dirty, filthy buggers, don't give a rat's toss. Go where they want, walk where they want. They do what they want, whatever they want. I would run over the fucking top of them. Or oh, what's your language, you called Caroline, but with a smile. She shifted on the seat to see through the rear window. The taxi left the riverside several streets ago, passed down a slope and beneath a railway bridge, turning and passing the place where the old mortuary building stood, near where they held the car boot sale on Sundays. Her and Mo came regularly. Mo was her boyfriend. She and her six-year-old daughter lived with him. Her street was the first drop-off point on the way home, thank God. She would be there in ten minutes, and thirty lying beside him. The very thought, but it was true. Mo was like normality. If only she could close her eyes and count to ten, then open them again, and there she was beside him. She back, sat back in the seat. Jill was looking at her. Helen smiled. An hour later and she was home, but still sitting in the kitchen, still wearing her coat and shoes. She held a photograph in her hand. Others lay in her lap and a few on the floor. She brought them out as soon as she got home. It didn't depress her seeing them, but neither did it cheer her up. Family was family, no matter what. People said that and it was true. Blood is thicker than water. If it was Brian, it was Brian. It was so unlikely. But if it was? She smiled for some reason. A weary smile. Ironic also. Families don't finish. You run away, but they catch you up. Families are ghosts. Presences. What if he had recognised her? She drew the coat about her shoulders, feeling a bit shivery. She should have gone to bed. She was tired sitting with the coat shielding her. It was weary, weary and tired. That was her. Tiredness, where did it come from? From living. Exhaustion. She was too weary to smile. She'd been working all night dealing cards, dealing cards and taking money, putting up with it all, everything. And now here she was, not sound asleep. And she should have been... Snug, warm, just warm. The heat from Moe was so, so, so warm. So warm. In beside him and away from everything and his body. She loved his body. She did. Why did she? Men and women. All these things and in her mind too. All just going round and round. Her head lolled. Her eyes open, only the tiredness, but not wanting to go to bed. She didn't want to. This is part of the problem that we are seen as a branch of English literature. Mm -hmm. And the older I get, the more offensive I find it. Mm -hmm. Actually, I now find it really offensive. There's almost nothing makes me as angry as hearing about that. I mean, uh, my own grandmother, uh, maybe a, a one or two of you who know my work may know, my grandmother was a Gaelic speaker. She didn't have any English. It was beaten out of our family and our community from Lewis. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. It's a Lewis kind of community, Hebridean community. She was born in uh, 1880, two years before James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, and some years before Samuel Beckett, are the, who are the three writers at my own work, usually gets put into a bag with here in the US. You know, as though it's a kind of substream of consciousness derived from that. And I think, well, it wasn't. My grandmother had no idea. <laughs> she was two years older than them. I'm her grandson. I could not speak Gaelic. Neither could my father and his four brothers because it was beaten out of our community. As Irish Gaelic was at one point. And they do come together. There are points, you know, where... Uh, you know, again, if we go back before 1603, uh, that, and I mean by that because James the first, you know, when he did the plantation in, in Ireland uh, in the north, which was to defeat the McDonalds and so on, and, and beat uh, beat the Gaelic culture, uh, and that that was when. Uh, anyway, you know, I don't want to go on about that too much. But the thing about it's important to recognise is a distinctive literary tradition. Our tradition from people like James Hogg, and you and you would include people like uh, even a se- certain short stories. Those of you who know Walter Scott, some of the stories were Walter Scott even, and you realise, look at Jeannie Deans and Heart of Midlothian, how great as you think, how great a near the guy had, even on occasion, formally really good, you know, uh, and it's almost in keeping with what we know that uh, Burns and James Hogg were doing, and that way of using language differently using the Scottish la- language or the way people speak. So in a sense, you would see my own work, Adam mentioned how late it was. And then you think of Irvin, Irvin Welsh's work, some of the younger generation, uh, who, who's from the east coast of Scotland. So his traditions are not the same as mine. Mine is kind of West Coast Gaelic, which is uh, Q Gaelic. Uh, Irvin Welsh and the uh, east coast of Scotland, right the way up, that's kind of the old, and on my f- another side of my family come from that tradition. So they're P Gaelic. You know, it's very, you know, you get all these subtleties and terms in the way that some of us use the English, uh, our version of the English language. So in a way, I mean, always to put us into this bag with English literature, you may understand, <laughs> come to understand, why it is so wrong to do that. But the problem is that uh, most everybody in the Anglo-American world does the same. It, certainly, even in Scotland, that's what happens. I mean, I was a professor at Glasgow University. That's the way they would teach me. That's why I fucking resigned. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they have no conception of it, uh, really. <laughs> what I've come to realise, uh, or rather work through in terms of writing essays and so on, is that the term British really... I mean, don't, Britain is just like a geographical thing. That's what most of us in Scotland believe. We don't kind of... We, we, uh, whereas both from America and within England, they all say, oh, we're Brits. No, we're not Brits at all. Uh, the, the idea of Brit for me is like a, a bourgeois imperialist forum that wants to kind of grasp everyone. And even when you look at the, uh, the history of talking about Britain in that sense, it applied to the Commonwealth. So someone who was a kind of a, had worked the way right up the ladder in New Zealand or Australia or Canada, they would have been described by people in Whitehall as Brits, mm-hmm. you know. So if you realise that, that, no, we're not Brits at all. Mm-hmm. Go and tell somebody in Dublin or in Derry City or in Glasgow. <laughs> would, would you go a little bit more into the, 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 the intellectual life, the literary life and political and all that intersection and how, uh, uh, the, what's at stake for, for Scottish literature in, mm-hmm. in the vote next year? Uh, well, I, I don't know about about Scottish literature so much. I mean, I, I think it's a general a general situation that ultimately will face literature in a way, you know, uh, how we survive. I mean, bookshops and so on, and so there is a, there is a general issue. I just think it's a period that will eventually kind of. Uh, I don't feel too pessimistic. Adam will be glad to hear. Another, I don't really. I feel as though. Uh, well, anyway, that's another discussion. Uh, but the way it is for Scotland, I think people like me, it would be a very sad thing if uh, Scottish people did not decide that they wanted to determine their own existence. 
And I think that's it's a kind of sadness if that was to happen. I now think that the the move is away from that. I do think that the, the vote will be. See, we must remember that the vote was positive in 1979. It was simply that the right wing doctored, doctored the way we, we looked at it. Uh, that was a government that, whose uh, figurehead was Margaret Thatcher. Uh, they doctored at that time, so the way that they came, they, they, they said eventually was that 60% of the adult voting population have to be in favour of independence. 60% of the voting population. I mean, that was an extraordinary. I don't think there's any kind of, how could any? Uh, it's, it was just kind of, it was basically impossible. This time it's, it's not, uh, it, won't, it won't be like that. Uh, at all. There is another thing, uh, maybe this is a thing that I should say for people here too. People like myself are not nationalists. We are not, I regard that with as much dubiety as I do the, the notion of patriotism. We are not nationalists. There are some nationalists amongst us, but there are others who aren't. So our uh, sense of solidarity and uh, commonality and so on are with ordinary people in England and, uh, and various other places and in Wales. My wife's Welsh. You know, I mean, it's not like... Uh, I don't really feel that form of nationalism at all. Uh, uh, but actually, uh, many of us are opposed to it. I don't see why not nationalism can be good in our country and then we'll oppose it in other countries. I, I feel as if we have to be consistent on that. I don't have any... I I have only feelings of contempt, disgust, and nausea to think of uh, those who want to kind of talk about an old Scottish monarchy. I mean, here's another thing. The Scottish National Party are going to keep on the, the English monarchy, or the British monarchy, whatever you want. The monarchy. They're not going to be a republic. They're keeping on the monarchy. Can you imagine that? I mean, uh, on my father's side... My great grandfather, uh, no, my great great grandfather, he was one of the last crofters up in that part of Aberdeenshire. In 1841, he's, he's, he had a croft there, you know, and you think, well, that all land now is, belongs to aristocracy and landowners. Now, that, they were part of the clearances too, you know, that part of Angus. And I mean, those of you who, who know Scottish uh, history or diaspora history in this co country, you'll be aware of the differences in kind of uh, movements. The same with uh, Irish. And, and with different uh, communities, Eastern Europe, uh, you, you, Italian, German and Czech, you would know when certain uh, uh, groups from your own country emigrated and you know what part of the states they came to. So you know, for example, McDonald's, uh, McDonald's where, uh, just say, Nova Scotia, West Nova Scotia, parts of Canada, uh, McDonald's, because that would be 1688. Where was it? 1688, that was... Uh, think of all the periods where the McDonald's were being hammered. Uh, 1610, what was it? That would be the, the East Coast. You know, going down towards uh, Tobacco, Virginia, and places like that. Uh, and then uh, McDonald's again, uh, 1688, where, wherever that would have been. That would have been maybe Canada, right? And then McDonald's later on, say post Culloden, well, anything post Culloden would be, that would probably be around about Cape Breton. No, no. 1688 is when the, uh, Scotland were tra <laughs> was trying to get its own little kind of uh, empire. And they were given Nova Scotia. Of course, that's why the McDonald's ended up in Cape Breton, around that area. But you know, uh, say Mackenzie's and my side of the family, then they all came to around Seattle, around that area. That's all the loose kind of people. Traditionally, what you find is that villages and communities tended to go to the, uh, the same area because people back home would tell them, come here and you'll get a job, you know, or where's all the Lewis men? I mean, my granny's big sister, my great aunt, she married, a, she was a Mackenzie, she married a McDonald and she was secretary of the Gaelic Society in Seattle for 30 years. And her, my granny's young sister, uh, married a MacArthur from Lewis, a, a, a guy Angus MacArthur, and all these MacArthur's are all now down LA and San Francisco and around that area. And uh, the youngest brother of that family 
Donald Roderick Mackenzie. Well, he was a. I mean, a lot of the guys always went to the coast because this is what they were good at. This is what they knew was subsistence economies and fishing. And he was a salmon fisher out off the Pacific coast and he died on his boat, unfortunately, you know. So if you go, and you'll find other, other families are the same. Now, if you go around, decide off to say, from Angus and Aberdeen, now, unfortunately, they raised the standard in just before the, America, the War of Independence here. Uh, they raised the 78th standard just like uh, between Dingwall and Angus around that area. And what happened, of course, well, they went the wrong side. <laughs> because, unfortunately, they came to fight for the English royal family. They hoped that uh, they would win and they would get their land back after the 1745 war, uh, Battle of Culloden. Unfortunately for them and fortunately for everybody else, <laughs> uh, they were on the losing side. But these people had, they were just like an extraordinary kind of regiment, all the Angus uh, Aberdeenshire people and from Wick and Caithness, North East, I'm genuflecting here, the North East. <laughs> but they all, uh, 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 they all came down uh, to, and landed all round about New York, uh, Boston to New York. And after the War of Independence, they kind of gradually went up and settled down Buffalo, and then they had to keep going. So they went up uh, into Canada, and then up by Montreal, and you'll see Glengarry there, and that's where they all settled. So you'll know that, that those Scottish, the Scottish kind of diaspora between, uh, like Montreal right down, going towards uh, in Ontario, going towards there, uh, that's all from that, like, 17, 1778 or something. They were called a 78 Regiment. Maybe that was the period. So, bec because of that, you know, like, uh, I should say also the, the influence in our, our language is also Norse. Because there are people up in the Western Hebrides, right down to County Cork. You know, from uh, uh, the old Gaelic, kind of, uh, right up to Orkney, up, going up towards Shetland. Uh, and at that time, headquarters was an Isla, and an Isla man. And it was the O'Neills and the O'Donnells, McDonald's. McNeil O'Neill. And McNeils are all, to this day, all around about uh, uh, Tyree. See, around Tyree and, uh, and Barra, going up to us, Barra, so not Tyree, Barra. All those islands all around there, there's still McNeils all there, McDonald's. Uh, and you, you can see all the movements there. It's all to do with that old period, you know. So these, they were not, uh, they were Norse until uh, 1261. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, and these influences are on, in my, my novel that was published in, uh, rather, that was set in the US, uh, a novel I came out, I wrote about, uh, I was published about 10 years ago, was You Have to Be Careful in the Land of the Free. Now, in that novel, I actually I spelled words in the correct way, which is, is we, we, were all, we were brought up to regard the way we spoke as, like, slang and a kind of inferior version of English. This also relates to, to your question, too. Uh, in my work, the, the How Late It Was novel, as any, anyone who, who knows about the novel, I mean, the notoriety that I received and the, the hostility I received at that time 20 years ago now, that was described as uh, like the drunken, uh, rambling uh, slang and dialects, so on, all of that. Uh, and I would argue and argued at the time, why is how we use language a slang? Why will you not even give us the courtesy of saying that we, we, we have a language? They wouldn't even allow us a language. Even our language had to be an inferior form of English. When you kind of think of it in these terms, you realise that we're involved in an old story here, imperialism. Ultimately, this is a thing that draws together different cultures, whether it's Yiddish and Hebrew, or whether it's English and the different languages within Scotland, or whether it's what happened in Yugoslavia eh, eh, many, many years ago, around about. Eh, again, it's just whatever the, the people in control are, Turkey, Whatever happens to the, the Kurdish people, you're not allowed to use your own language. You can't even write a love poem to your your boyfriend or girlfriend. It's not even poems, but it's a criminal offence. You know what I mean? As it was for, for Gaelic users at different times. So these are the things that... Uh, the, 
I actually spelled the words uh, uh, hoose, for example. Hoose was described. It's always, I mean, if my uh, grandchildren now have grandchildren, if they use the word hoose in the primary school just now, as they do, that's playground conversation, they would be punished in some way. They'd be reprimanded. Speak properly. Don't use slang in this classroom. It's house. Now, of course, when uh, my work's been translated into Norwegian on a couple of occasions and in other kind of that uh, area. And in Norwegian, you know, like, uh, oh, that's, you just sound like us, you know. And we have all those words like sur and uh, stur and all the OU. I mean, the Anglo Americans are now trying to even steal that. They now say, you have to say dour and stour. But what does it mean? It's doer. Now in BBC, now BB, the BBC voice is now dour. So your kids, your gra grandkid come home and say, oh, the way you say uh, dour is wrong, you say doer is dour. These are part of like a linguistic heritage. That's the Norse. So I, I kind of spell uh, hus, as we say it in Scotland, H-U-I-S. Whereas uh, the tra the, usually it's done as a phonetic transcription of the English in an English uh, transcription, uh, H O O S E. So people would say to me, why do you use slang? Even my mother would say that, a school teacher. <laughs> I would go, mum, look, this is our Norse tradition. This is, a, a, this is a, an anti-imperialist usage. This is why I spell in that way. It's both to attack uh, imperial kind of a uh, presumption, you know, 